It's October 1st. It's the month of Halloween. And it's us here with Crime After Crime. I am John Lorden. And I am Danielle Hallen, and this is my spooky month, so I'm very excited to be here. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Halloween's my favorite. I don't know if anyone knows, I deck my entire house out. Oh, you do? I was going to actually... I sure do. I was going to ask about that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty big on Halloween also. Uh, and occasionally, I'll even put up a video of how my house looks. Like, I'll, I'll put it out on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm really big into projectors over the past couple years. Me too. Okay. Relatable. <laughs> okay. What kind? What kind of projectors are you using? So, it's, well, it's really cheesy ones we yeah. get from Target, but it'll yep. just be like ghosts, you know, just yeah. kind of like floating around on the outside of the house. Uh -huh. We have I snowflakes for Christmas too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I've got two of those ghost sets and I have this big sidewall to the house and I put both of them on that same wall. So it looks like there's like a ghost dance that's going on on that <laughs> sidewall. Um, I've got one that literally just projects a giant skull. Oh, wow. And I shoot that on the garage door so that it's, you know, like seven feet tall. Uh, oh, my gosh. <laughs> and then I've got one that shoots lightning, like it looks like lightning flashes. And I have that all around the skull head. So there's these lightning bolts that kind of come on and off. And that one has sound. So, oh, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. So there's lightning sounds that go on with that. Uh, but the real centerpiece is I learned about this company called Atmos FX. And they do different things that you can project into your window. So on the second floor, I've got a window where I put this little thin plastic that acts like a screen and I project what looks like ghosts in the room up there. So, and I'm not talking like cartoony ghosts. I'm talking like they actually have actors that dress up in costume and they put all these kind of ghostly effects around them. Uh, and I run that through a sound system that I run down by the door one year. A little girl came up to the door and she's like, why is your house so scary? <laughs> You're like, I just can't help myself. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I know. So, um, yeah, that's that's how far I'm going. I'll be sure to send you a link to a, a I was, video. I was about to say, I need to up my game because, you know, I didn't know they made that kind of thing for Halloween. I know I went to one house for Christmas one year and they yeah. had a projector similar to that with Santa. Like it looked like he was putting presents at the tree. I was like, yeah. that is the coolest thing. How do they do this? I'm going to need that because yeah. I mean, we go all out. We started a whole competition within our neighborhood. Awesome. Awesome. Uh -huh. Well, that'll give you the, the leg up for sure. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that company, they also do the Santa stuff. They, they've got all kinds of different projections and different packages. And of course, you know, I bought the individual ones that I wanted and then did my own video editing work on it so that I could get it the right length and added all this yeah. creepy music under it and all that. So yeah, it's a lot of fun. Um, you and got then, me beat, John. Well, and you still need a projector. <laughs> so you, you just, you can buy like a cheapy projector. I bought yeah. like a $50 projector or something on Amazon. On. But uh, the hardest thing is actually the screen, especially if it's rear projected. They sell fabrics that you can use for that. But yeah. I've done it with just like almost like a light, really light cotton material or a, almost a clear plastic. But you know how sometimes it's kind of white. They like, have like milky looking. Yeah, it, exactly. Like a milky looking plastic that works pretty good for rear projection. So a bunch of Halloween mm -hmm. tips for everyone. I know. <laughs> To start well, off the episode. Yeah, I know. Well, you're with two people right now who love Halloween, so yeah. you're in for it. <laughs> yep. Settle in. We've got more for you. But before that, yep. uh, we want to remind you how to vote for episodes of Crime After Crime. And remember, after the episode publishes on the first of the month, you have up to seven days to head over to the Twitter account at Crime After Pod. I've been really good about pinning the poll there. So it's usually right at the top. You can vote for whichever favorite story you have right there or... You guys can also vote on the YouTube version of this. Just hover your mouse over the screen or just tap your finger on the screen and it should pop up a little eye. You just click that, you vote, bada bing, bada boom. Don't know why it was so difficult for the whole first year, but I'm super proud of all of us. Yeah, we all figured it out together. <laughs> we did. And we also figured out that that eye is the eye missing from Danielle's name. And now, yes. now we know We've where it is. We've solved lots of mysteries this year. I'm really happy. <laughs> but we also now have voting results. Yes, we have voting results with Danielle for episode one of season two, Florida Man. What happened, Danielle? All right, you guys. John wasn't lying, I don't think. On Twitter, he beat me by 60%. 
Well, he had 60%. I had 40%. All right. And then on YouTube, I was absolutely blown out of the water. I only had 28% of the votes while John had 71%. Do you, so. Do you hear that? Do, he won. Do you feel that? I that, feel it. I do. <laughs> it's the season of revenge, Danielle. And it has started with my victory. Thank you. Thank you, listeners, so much. You know what? I'm going to give you the mug, but you can even ask John. I forgot it. I had to yeah. go run and get it real quick. That was me just not wanting to hand it back. Yeah. But yeah. You know talk, talk to your psychiatrist about that, Danielle. There oh, you look, go. We already I blew will. it. Yep. There we it's go. It's okay. <laughs> We're starting off the year right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Bringing we, it in perfect. We had to blow the mug handoff. <laughs> we uh, did. It wouldn't be crime after crime if we got it right. <laughs> it sure wouldn't be. But Ooh, good limey. job, John. Thank exactly. you. Thank you. Exactly. Yes. It's delicious. Um, yeah, and thanks to everyone. I was so proud of that episode. I love that episode. Um, that was great. Yeah, I love the stories. I love all the additional stories we had from other people in the community, the cameos, all that stuff. Really, really fun. And part of what I'm looking forward to in the season of Revenge is me winning this so that Danielle has to plan some type of anniversary special. And, and you know what? The funny thing about this is that it's giving me so much anxiety already. I am <laughs> terrible at I'm terrible at planning things. I'm the kind of person that like will have a great idea, but like way too late in the game. Okay. Way too late. So I'm already trying to think because I'm scared already. You well, scared me last episode. You brought a good one. You clearly you you won. You're here. <laughs> and how am I supposed to outdo DB Tuber giving a big thank you? Oh man. You know, yeah, and that's congratulations a tough one. and <sighs> Yeah, that's that's a tough one, but you've got a year to think about it. So uh, don't freak out, but it's okay to be scared because we're in the month of Halloween and exactly. we wanted to share. Obviously, we've given you some decorating tips, but we wanted to <laughs> also give you some other tips so you and your family stay safe. And some of these are certainly about um, children for, for parents out there, but we've also worked in some other tips. And I just want to mention that the, the National Safety Council has guidelines that they publish over on their website at nsc.org. So uh, we're using some of their guidelines. I've added a little bit to it. I've got one tip in particular for some of you college students out there. I really want you guys to hear. Let's share some details. How can people stay safe, Danielle? So children are more than twice as likely to be hit by a car on Halloween than any other day of the year. If children are allowed out after dark, fasten reflective tape to their costumes and bags or give them glow sticks to help increase their visibility. And this is actually one tip I already use. My kids are always covered head to toe yeah. in glow sticks. <laughs> yeah. Well, as a kid that got hit by a car, I can tell you, yes, please, please, please do this. Um, it's it's It kind of tripped me out when I first heard that stat. I had never heard that before twice as likely to be hit by a car on Halloween. And of course, you've got all these kids yeah. you know, running all over the place and sometimes they're wearing dark costumes. Um, yeah, it's just a, a little recipe for disaster. So we want to be safe. Also think about these conditions when you're buying your kids those costumes. Obviously, brighter colors are more visible, but then you also have that masks might obstruct their vision. So uh, really think about that when you're getting your kid dressed up and sending them out. And you know, I know kids want to be certain characters. You know, the Scream character was yeah. famous for a good long stretch. And that's basically just a big black cloak and a mask. Mm -hmm. um, and but there's there's also those inflatables now. People wear like the inflatable yeah. T-Rex costumes and all of that. I can, first of all, you're not gonna be able to get out of the way fast enough. Right. And then second of all, there's no way you can see anything, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So really, um, you know, work with your kids to pick some good safe costumes for them. And Danielle? And if you're driving on Halloween, watch for children walking on roadways, medians, curbs. Be sure to enter and exit driveways carefully, also alleys as well. And that's another big one. I know in the neighborhood I go trick-or-treating, people sometimes will fly out of their driveway. And I yeah. mean, it's almost like they're frustrated in a sense because there's like hundreds of kids and they're just trying to get out. But be patient. Yeah. It's, it's a one night of fun. <laughs> yeah. And you also have those quick situations that happen. Sometimes kids yeah. will be chasing each other and all of a sudden someone will go running out into a road or something like that. Yep. So um, be extra, extra safe. Uh, this is a really good consideration that I didn't think about. You, you might want to remind your younger, more inexperienced drivers to do as little driving on Halloween as possible. Don't take your kid with a learner, learner's permit out yeah. on the night of Halloween. Um, I guess you can also apply that possibly to older drivers that might not have the same reflex time that they used to. 
uh, or people that want to retire and in their retirement get intentionally into car accidents. I'm not speaking for myself there. But <laughs> I might actually be. Um, I promise I won't do that on Halloween. And also, if you're walking around, remember to put electronic devices down, keep your head up, and always walk. Don't run across the street. And this is actually one that I've seen in badly before on yeah. my own. Kids, you know, trying to text and take pictures and Snapchats, and they're not looking, and they cross the street thinking they're safe, and there's a car coming. So be yep. very careful. Uh, if you do have older children going out on their own, make sure that you plan a route with them and agree on a specific time that they should return home. You might also want to consider having a family tracking app on their phone. Also remind your children not to eat anything they're given until they bring it home and you have a chance to inspect it. And that's not like the parent sarcasm where like inspection means eating it right. <laughs> without them knowing. This is a real inspection. Actually make yes. sure that they're not eating anything dangerous. Yeah. Oh, Danielle, you don't take all the best candies from your kids uh, during the inspection? <laughs> Uh, I may do that. I may <laughs> take a lot of their Twizzlers. There's a fee. There's a fee for the inspection. Yep. Um, and this is something, my personal addition um, for the college age kids out there, please don't go to a bar alone. And whatever mm -hmm. happens once you're there, especially don't leave a bar alone. If you've been drinking, stay cautious on bridges and around water sources. I'm telling you guys, honestly, from so the bottom. Many. Yeah, from the bottom of my heart, there are far too many of these cases where we see someone that's out with a group of friends, they leave their friends, and we don't see those people again. Mm -hmm. And it's terrible, and I don't know how else to raise awareness to this. That's why I'm actually including it in here. Um, so please, please, please stay safe. I want you guys to have fun, but please don't leave that group. And of course, everyone out there needs to stay away from real life haunted houses. Oh boy. Whoa. Yes. <laughs> or right. you could be like me when I was a teenager and go to them willingly and then wish you never had about two hours later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Danielle, we're ready for your story. What do you have for us this month? All right, this one was difficult because a lot of the stories were really, really dark, a lot darker than I wanted to go. So I kind of decided to play into a very personal fear of mine. You know, I know we all have our fears, but I'm really going out on a limb with this one and I'm hoping some of you guys possibly relate to it. I'm sure you will. So ever since I was little, I've always loved scary things like haunted houses, all the scary movies. Like I just said, I would drive out to the middle of nowhere with friends to investigate abandoned cabins, homes with haunting histories. I actually have a couple of those on film, but despite <laughs> my love for the excitement of it, I had a deep fear. Every time I started to poke around these abandoned and empty homes and lots, I was always overcome with the fear that someone was watching me, that someone was squatting in the home, or I'd even create more elaborate ideas, <laughs> knowing me, no yeah. one's surprised, yeah. that someone was, uh, you know, the person in there was watching me, and they were the reasons for the home's demise to begin with, along with all the people in it. I was even scared of my own home half the time. I was the kind of person that checked around the corners. The shower curtain could never be closed. And then every single door either had to be fully open or fully closed. Um, there was just something to me and still is something to me about a place meant for comfort and safety being invaded unknowingly that sent chills down my spine. So the story I have today is that nightmare for me come true and a nightmare for a lot of people for about six or seven years. So in 2007, authorities started to investigate a string of burglaries that were occurring in Southern and Central Utah along Iron, Kane, and Garfield counties. It was obvious to them that all of the burglaries were connected and likely being done by a single person. Someone was breaking into the cabins that were typically used as summer vacation homes during the winter. And in every cabin, there would usually always be an empty bottle of whiskey, signs that beds had been slept in, food was always missing, and even scarier, the home's guns. So. That's already terrifying. Yep. <laughs> the idea of someone being in your personal space, I can't do that. And whoever was breaking into these cabins was absolutely dangerous. After taking the home's guns, they would often shoot up the inside of the cabin. There were even instances when religious pictures were taken off the wall and shot until unrecognizable. Hmm. It seemed that this person was squatting in the home until all of the supplies were gone and then they'd move to another. And at some of these cabins, the person responsible would even write notes to the owners that they would find later on thanking them for their hospitality and signing it as Troy James the Redhead. Imagine coming to your cabin. Wow. And, you know, I mean, he would even use the restroom in places he wasn't supposed to. Right, right. Uh -oh. So authorities began to worry they had a dangerous hermit mountain man roaming through their counties. 
They sent out a warning to the locals that this man was possibly armed and dangerous. This man appeared to show very antisocial behavior, and they had no idea what his agenda really was or if he would harm a cabin owner if they got in his way. And based on the timing and things taken from the homes, they believed this person was living off grid. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, this created a ton of different myths. Years passed. Yes, I said years, and dozens of cabins were broken into and all left in the same state, but authorities felt no closer to capturing this mysterious man. They had searched all through the woods and managed to find a couple of creepy campsites that likely belonged to their suspect, but most of them had been abandoned. One of the campsites, however, appeared as if it was still in use because someone left 14 guns behind. Wow. All stolen from cabins. But in 2011, they got a bit closer. A group of bow hunters were hunting in Kane County when a mysterious looking man in snowshoes crossed their paths. It looked as if he was living in the mountains and he was very clearly upset that he had been seen. More sightings continued of this mysterious mountain man and authorities believed this might be their guy. Then in December of that year, the mountain man triggered a motion activated camera outside of a cabin in Kane County. And this was the actual very first picture anyone had ever seen of this man. Uh, until this time, everyone had wild speculations like Bigfoot. Like, I mean, it was right. just going crazy. Over the month of January, other trail cameras managed to pick up glimpses of the man and authorities were able to identify him a few different ways. In a break in that occurred in 2009, fingerprints had been left behind, I think on a window frame, mm -hmm. and they were able to match this back to a man named Troy Knapp. And Troy Knapp matched the picture of the guy with all the tattoos and everything seen in surveillance. So it turned out that Troy had a long history of criminal activity. He was seen, or he was from Kalamazoo, Michigan, which since chills down my spine because I actually just covered a case from Kalamazoo and the exact same time frame this creepy man left. It was an unsolved murder, so mm. that threw me off. Yeah. Um, but right off the bat, he was tangled up with the law. In his early teenage years, he was convicted of things like running from authorities, breaking and entering, the list goes on. His stepfather was a sportsman and had taught Troy wilderness skills. So this is what he had used to survive so far this whole time. In 2004, he fully fell off the authorities' radar for the first time since his teens after being released from a prison in California. He had been on parole, but he fled and nobody could locate him anywhere. This is when he found his way to Utah to hide in the mountains and leave the whole community in fear for years. And he was, in fact, potentially violent towards others and not just someone that ransacked homes because a homeless man recognized him and said that Troy had beaten him with a rock over camping gear. Ooh. There was also a 69-year-old man that had been you know, shot in a bizarre way and partially buried around the same time these burglaries were happening. And despite no evidence to tie Knapp to the crime, Everyone believes it's odd because he was in the area at the time and the gun that was used wasn't one typically used for hunting. Right, right. So authorities at this point believe they had put the puzzle pieces together. During the summer, Troy would stay well hidden in the woods with the supplies he had gathered from the cabins. And he had an entire horde of guns, radios, dehydrated foods, camping gear, batteries, other random supplies. But they needed to find his current campsite in order to find him. They first attempted to find Troy in February using a team of 30 men, helicopters, and a ton of technology like infrared. But he somehow managed to completely evade them. And this scared the community 10 times more. People were already thinking this was something inhuman. And then, you know, even when they found out his identity, the fact that he could stay hidden with that many people and in an infrared helicopter going by, people were terrified. Yeah. So during the summer, authorities started another search, a full-blown search for his campsite, and they managed to find a possible location in Kane County. But as soon as they found it, he was gone. He was basically like this ghost. But it was essential that they find him because his behavior was escalating. He was becoming a lot more violent within the homes. Again, he would use the restroom in places <laughs> and just very, very scary things. But he didn't manage to stay hidden for long. In October, a video camera captured Troy in San Pete County in Utah. He had a gun over his shoulder and was checking for surveillance through binoculars but he clearly missed the camera. He waved his arms a bit to check for motion sensors, and once he decided he was safe, he broke into a cabin in the area. Days later, on October 3rd, authorities again brought in a massive search team and a helicopter to try to find him, but they weren't able to locate him. Wow. I know. People were freaked out. You know, they couldn't understand. I mean, this is, you know, the, all these different types of technology are bring, being brought in, and they cannot locate this man. They even knew where he was, and he seemed to be moving it you know, inhuman rates through the mountains. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yep. Locals were scared to stay at their cabins. Hunters were nervous to go out knowing they could pass any guy with a gun and it could be this infamous mountain man. Every time authorities thought they were getting close, he managed to disappear into thin air. He was traveling upwards of 20 miles a day and knew almost every single hiding place along those miles and miles of mountains. And he always knew just when to sneak in and out of a cabin right before getting caught. He was mm -hmm. terrifying. And then finally, the tip came in that led to his capture. A man named Dale Fuller and his 15-year-old son were out antler hunting when they crossed paths with a man on March 29th, 2013. The man seemed relatively friendly at first. He was speaking of going up to high country. He was asking Dale and his son all sorts of things about you know, where they had come from, how the snow had been in those areas, if they had crossed paths with any other people. But the whole time, Dale's lab was growling at this man. And despite many attempts to get this dog to calm down, he would not stop. I mean, they were bopping him on the nose, trying to get him to calm down, but his hair was on edge. And Dale said he remembered the second the dog's hair went up, he said his own hair just like went up. He knew something was wrong. Oh. So yeah, he started to scope out the man and this guy appeared to be very rugged looking, but the one thing that stood out is he had an assault rifle. And after years of hunting in the area, no one typically used an assault rifle like this one. So they started to ask him about his gun and why he needed something like this. And he looked straight at Dale and his son and said, well, I don't plan on shooting you. And then told them he was a mountain man or the mountain man. At this point, they're so rattled from what he just said that they didn't hear right. And he just walked off. Whoa. Yeah. So after parting ways, Dale knew exactly who he had just encountered. He had heard all of the stories. So as soon as he got to an area with service, he called a friend who was married to a local deputy. The deputy sent Dale a picture of the man they were looking for. And sure enough, they were just speaking to the mysterious mountain man. Within 45 minutes, authorities were on scene and had decided to use Troy's own tactics against him. They tracked Troy using his own snowshoe prints for three days, covering 15 miles total. And while on the search for him, multiple calls started to come in that cabins had been completely ransacked in the area. They were finally on his trail and he likely had no idea. So all these people were coming back for spring. It was Easter weekend. You know, they're coming back to their cabins, trying to open them back up again and just disaster. Right. So by that Monday, authorities brought out everything they had. They had enough, they wanted to get this man. There was a 50 person task force, including half a dozen federal agents, members of seven separate sheriff's departments, members for the Utah Department of Public Safety and a couple of more departments. And they came up with a plan and around midnight on April 2nd, they all headed out. They had snowmobiles, snowcats, helicopters, dozens of people in snowshoes in the mountains silently waiting. They didn't even know at this point what cabin Troy was hiding in out of a certain cluster of cabins, but their plan was basically to bring in a helicopter to scare him and hopefully flush him out in the open. Pretty good plan, if you ask me. Yeah, <laughs> they probably yeah. learned from all their other you know, plans that didn't work out. But they didn't even need this. By 9 a.m. that day, Troy was spotted by a helicopter out on the front porch of a home he had broken into. And then again, he was spotted chopping wood. When the helicopter came over him, he grabbed his rifle and fired several shots directly at it before taking off on foot south. But what he didn't know is he was running straight into dozens of men hiding and waiting for him. Mm. After a few changes in direction that resulted in him coming face to face with multiple officers, he finally surrendered. Troy had been terrorizing an area of land and people's homes the size of Delaware. That's wow. how much land he was covering. Wow. In conditions that many people couldn't even stand overnight. They would send search parties out for anyone who didn't come back you know, even one night into this, because it was so cold, conditions were so rough, but he was surviving this. Mm -hmm. As time passed, more of his campsites were found, many by cougar hunters and elevations as high as 9,000 feet. Wow. They weren't just makeshift tents either. High up in the rocky terrain, he managed to make framed doors and decently elaborate homes for himself, given the circumstances. Yeah. Uh, hunters ended up finding his random stashes all over the mountains. One couple even found a hefty bag hanging in a 40-foot tree that contained a sleeping bag, matches, shoes, a beanie, chainsaw sharpeners, a ton of stuff. Troy was charged in beaver, emery, Garfield, Iron, Kane, Sam Pete, and Sevier counties for his crimes, including robbery, evading authorities, firing weapons at federal agents, and more. He did end up agreeing to take pleas, different ones for each county he had charges in. In total, he had stayed extended periods of time in 40 different homes. Wow. 
Exactly. He was given anywhere from one to 15 years in prison in each county, along with his federal sentence of 10 and a half years in prison. Um, what's interesting that authorities said is that the burglaries themselves were obviously bad and terrifying, but the worst crime he committed that gave him the most time was firing at the helicopter. So uh. even after for so even after all this time of terrifying people staying in their homes without them knowing it, using all of their things, the one thing that got him the most time was the helicopter. Yeah, he apparently to officers seemed very relieved to be caught. He compared himself to Robin Hood. <laughs> and said that he was only taking the things that he needed from people that didn't need it. And he said that he was growing tired of the elements anyways. So huge, huge thank you to The Guardian, KSL, Utah People's Post, and Outside Online. There were some amazing articles on this. It's a horrifying and bizarre story and literally my worst nightmare. I am honestly shocked that in all those years, a homeowner didn't stumble in on him. Yeah. Yeah, that could have been really bad, especially seeing how he reacted once the authorities were closing in on him. Well, I mean, it's terrifying because not only was he able to get into these homes, but he was surviving off the land. I mean, it does. It's like a human Bigfoot to me. Like, it's mm -hmm. absolutely terrifying. And, you know, yeah. he was approaching these cabins in the middle of the night or early, early in the morning when it was still dark. All of the footage they captured of him, he looked so scary. Like, it was all in, like, the you know, nighttime vision and his right. eyes were just like popping and he looked terrifying. If, I mean, if I had woken up or walked into the house and just seen a man lounging around, I would have lost my absolute marbles. Like that is what nightmares are made of. Every single scary movie that I've watched and has terrified me involves some sort of cabin in the woods. There's mm -hmm. actually this one um, game. I don't know. I think it's only for PlayStation. It's actually like a scary story time game, like a storyline yeah. of a cabin in the woods and people watching them and murdering them off one by one. This is like literally what my nightmares <laughs> are absolutely <laughs> made of. And he did it for seven years. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Crazy. Uh, he wasn't tied to any of the um, other crimes, though, that people thought he might be related to. Nothing to do with. <clears throat> Not that they know of. They weren't able to really link him to anything. But I mean, okay. I'm sure he went through guns like no other. He had 14. There's no telling. There could be stuff all over the mountain. I mean, they yeah. found stuff everywhere. Again, this was the size of Delaware. Mm -hmm. But it created so many issues within the community. And it was interesting reading up on it because there were quite a few people who took it into their own hands to find this guy. Because no one knew you know, anything about him for the longest time, what he looked like, what he wore. It was like this big question mark. And obviously people's imaginations are going to run wild. Yeah. And there was like this saying all over town. There was one guy in particular who was like hunting this guy, <laughs> like yeah. actually hunting him. And he always stationed up in this one canyon looking for him. And the whole thing around the town was honk before you enter the canyon or you'll be shot. <laughs> thinking it's the mountain man. I know it literally created so much fear in this entire community. Right, Pe right. People were hunting him. Yeah. Yeah, I, I heard of a case similar to this. Uh, it's called the North Pond Hermit case. And I think this guy was at it for a couple decades. Wow. Um, but it was weird because people recognized the type of stuff that he was taking. And it was mostly like survival stuff. Like he, yeah. he would clear out their fridges, you know, batteries, things like that. Um, they did eventually track him down. And once again, um, trap cameras came into play. And uh, there was someone that was also hunting him, but it was someone that worked. He was a ranger, if I recall correctly. Um, yeah. But they, went, they, they brought him in and... They charged him, but it wasn't crazy, like a crazy amount of time, and it wasn't a crazy amount of money. And he's been just trying to kind of reacclimate to um, living in society with everyone else. Because after decades of living in that way, it was like he didn't even know how to fit in. And he wound up being this really educated, very well-spoken guy. Um, it was just this bizarre way of living that he wanted to do, and he wanted to be out on his own. And he needed certain materials and he would just kind of break in around this one neighborhood. And uh, it even got to the point where people were like leaving him letters outside and just saying, you know, what do you need? Just tell us what you just need. Just let us give it to you. Yeah. We'll just don't leave break it. In. We'll leave it out here for you. Yeah, exactly. Don't don't break in. Um, but even around that one, also the same thing. People are thinking, is this Bigfoot? Is this what is this? What's what's happening with all this stuff uh, being taken constantly? Exactly. And this guy, I mean, 
the amount of efforts law enforcement put into finding him. Yeah. And, you know, they would have a specific location. They would see a burglary, recognize a pattern, and they'd immediately get people on the ground. A ton of people, helicopters involved, and they couldn't find him. That's yeah. terrifying. And I mean, they would cover miles and miles. They had basically gotten, had this map and this kind of equation put together of how far they believe he could get based on like other searches they had done and they couldn't find him in that area so they're trying to guess how many miles a day he's moving yeah and i mean they just kept expanding and expanding and expanding and he just wasn't there he was literally a ghost mm -hmm. and you know he's he was spending extreme amounts of time in these cabins yeah he probably spent months in some of them and not a single person noticed the fact that no one walked in on him is absolutely terrifying to me yeah but i've seen kind of the same angle as well where a reporter that was he kind of was having this meltdown moment after his picture was released because he knew he could be recognized mm -hmm. um, and they were saying if this man had been out for any extended period of time alone like this in the woods this kind of that kind of isolation yeah and what it will do to you it was the same thing they're like you know he might not even value life anymore or like human life like he could be right totally on a separate page as everyone because he's been isolated for so long so it was scary i'm sure they had conversations i don't know if this information would be public but i'm sure they asked them about hey you know on this particular day when we were out searching for you like where were you hiding i mean is he burying himself in the ground so his heat signature isn't being found or does he have ca a cave system that he has worked out in the area like there's I'm so many questions I'm sure he answered them though, because he answered yeah. a lot of stuff. He even straight up, he straight up told the officers, he was like, yeah, I just don't like people. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that I want to hurt them. I just like, I don't want to be around them. So, he, yeah. I mean, he was, he sat there with a map and showed them all the places that he had been and what times he had gone there. And yeah. so he was open to giving information, but he spent a lot of time scaring the crap out of an entire community. Well, I'm glad they brought him in. And to your point, I'm glad that something really bad didn't happen with one of those families running into him, uh, especially yeah. knowing how well armed he was and, you know, always looking for weapons. So interesting. Well, I guess it's getting closer to that time where I'm going to tell my story. But before that, we're going to take a very short break. We'll be right back. Hey, Danielle, what are you doing November 8th through the 10th? Well, John, I'm glad you asked because I will be at the American Crime Festival where the world's leader in true crime, media, podcast, and citizen detectives are coming together all in one event. That's right. American Crime Fest is happening in Wildwood, New Jersey, and will include star-studded presentations and compelling panels from the world of true crime, like Aphrodite Jones going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Larry Pollard to debate the owl theory from Netflix's The Staircase. And let me tell you, Danielle, I heard- I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, I heard Aphrodite actually talk about that theory once before. She to say she's passionate about it is a vast understatement. Quite honestly, she, she gets pissed talking about it. <laughs> that makes me even more excited to see it. Yeah. But one other cool thing is that you guys will be able to go behind the scenes with your favorite podcasters like us, listen to experts discuss evidence and their theories on notable cases. And the lineup looks pretty good so far. Absolutely. Please visit AmericanCrimeFest.com for more info, including the current lineup. Uh, stay tuned. Keep visiting because they're on constantly adding new personalities, presenters, and topics. Don't miss the opportunity to meet, mingle, learn about, and discuss your favorite cases with your favorite podcasters, true crime TV personalities, and other citizen detectives at the Jersey Shore along the beautiful ocean front. Join us in Wildwood, New Jersey on November 9th and 10th for the American Crime Festival. And don't miss the VIP event on the evening of November the 8th. That's right. Come hang out with Danielle and myself at American Crime Fest. Welcome back, everyone. Well, here we go, Danielle. It's time. I'm so nervous. <laughs> Uh-oh. Why are you nervous? You're afraid I'm going to scare you with my story? No, you just mean business this season, and it's scaring me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if the season of revenge can continue. All right. Well, a lot of you out there know I got my start in true crime covering the Elisa Lamb case, which took place at a creepy hotel. The Cecil Hotel was home to at least two serial murderers, the site of numerous suicides, and of course is where Elisa Lamb's body was found in a water tank on top of the hotel in 2013. We all trust hotels to keep us safe. But did you know there was a hotel designed and built to do the exact opposite? 
Originally referred to by locals as the castle, it would eventually be called the murder castle by local law enforcement. Some people even believe that the man that built it may have been the same man known as Jack the Ripper. If you believe that or not, Herman Webster Mudgett, or as he's more infamously known as H.H. Holmes, is often credited with being America's first serial killer and designed and built one of the most terrifying places in America. By all accounts, a con artist, Mudgett started his life pulling his life of crime, pulling off insurance scams while he was attending the University of Michigan's Department of Medicine and Surgery. Stealing bodies from the morgue and setting them up to appear to have died in accidents, he collected tens of thousands of dollars from unsuspecting insurance companies while completing his education. After abandoning his first wife, Clara Lovering, and their child, Mudgett ripped off the name of a respectable Chicago family and became Henward Howard, Henry Howard, or H.H. H. Holmes. He moved to the Chicago community of Inglewood in 1885, leaving a trail of other crimes behind him, attached to his old name. And with his flashy and prominent new name, he was reset and ready to pull off more scams. The first scam would be finding another wife, and he's still technically married to his first. Uh, even though he did file for a divorce a few weeks after his second wedding, but that divorce was never finalized. He would have a daughter with his new wife. Several years later, he would marry a third woman while still technically being married to the first two. Holmes found work at a local drugstore in Inglewood, and he would eventually buy the store from the previous owner. Some accounts of this part of the story say that that owner mysteriously disappeared, but the 2017 novel, The True History of the White City Devil by Adam Selzer, uh, claims that that's fiction and that the original owner actually lived well into the 20th century. Growing his empire, he then purchased an open lot of land that was right across the street from the drugstore. He intended to build a two-story structure that would take up an entire city block with shops on the first level and apartments on the second. He even planned a space for a brand new drugstore. Once construction started, he was back to his old ways of scamming people. He would fire contractors after they had worked on parts of the building and never pay them, usually claiming that they were doing shoddy work. Then he'd bring in other contractors to continue their work and then go ahead and fire them and never pay them. He even tried to rip off a furniture manufacturer by hiding their materials, just hiding their stuff. Uh, as the building continued to be built in a truly Frankenstein fashion, his economic dreams started twisting into a demonic nightmare he decided to add a third level. It would be a 60-room hotel, and if his plan went right, it would be completed just in time for one of the largest events in the nation. The 1893 World's Columbian Exposition would be the celebration of the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus's arrival in America. It would run for six months, and more than 27 million people would attend. Talking investors into building a hotel that's only an hour's walk away to the fairgrounds was a very easy task for homes. Even though the, the hotel doesn't officially open, its true operations, his intent, does actually start. It was a playground for a serial killer. Holmes's design included soundproofed rooms, some that could only be locked from the outside. Reportedly, some rooms had no windows. There were secret passage, passageways, doors that opened into brick walls, trap doors, secret peepholes, closets with sliding panels, and literal mazes of hallways. And that's not even the worst of it. Certain rooms were set up as prison rooms, complete with alarm systems to tip him off to attempted escapes. There were burning rooms with blow torches built into the walls that he could activate remotely. Some were airtight rooms that he would use to either watch people slowly suffocate or use as a gas chamber by leaking gas into them. There was even a special chute system, kind of like a laundry chute, but it was for bodies. Each From each floor, the chutes would transfer bodies into the basement. And the nightmare continues in the basement. Down there was a surgical table, medieval stretching table, two furnaces, poisons, vats of acid and lime pits to dissolve remains. Of course, always looking for ways to make a buck, Holmes had connections through his education to numerous medical labs and schools. He reportedly sold the skeletons of several of his victims to them. 
He also tried another insurance scam, this time involving his assistant, Benjamin Peitzel. They planned to fake Benjamin's death so Holmes could collect $10,000. Rather than try to find a body to match Benjamin, Holmes figured he would just kill the real Benjamin himself. The insurance scams would eventually be his downfall. Holmes asked a convict for help finding a crooked attorney to assist in his insurance scams. He offered the convict 500 bucks, but being the guy he is, he scammed the convict too and never paid him. The convict, a train robber and Wild West outlaw, told the police about Holmes' insurance scam system. Though police didn't have any hard proof, they did have an old warrant from Texas where Holmes apparently took a horse without paying for it. Holmes was terrified of being taken back to Texas, where the price for stealing a man's horse could be extremely steep. So he actually confesses to the insurance scams. Investigators and reporters were finally looking into the murder castle. Pictures of the floor plan and torture rooms would show up in the newspapers, though author Adam Seltzer believes those are highly exaggerated, perhaps a side effect of the yellow journalism of the day. Police continued to dig deeper into his assistant's death, and they were able to effectively prove that he did indeed kill Benjamin. He was put on trial in 1895. The trial lasted only six days. He was found guilty and sentenced to death. But he's not done. In one last swindle, Holmes took a $7,500 offer from Hearst newspapers in exchange for his story and confession. He would wind up telling them, quote, I was born with the devil in me. I could not help the fact that I was a murderer, no more than the poet can help the inspiration to sing. I was born with the evil one. He also gave them numerous contradicting statements and facts that they were able to easily disprove. He eventually admitted to 27 murders and six attempted murders. Police at the time suggest it was probably more likely about 10, but his legend suggests that it could have actually been hundreds. Holmes was hanged on May 7, 1896 at the age of 34. Before his hanging, he recanted his previous confession and then was saying that he only killed two people. He also had one last request. He wanted to be buried 10 feet underground in solid concrete. It seems he was so afraid that someone was going to come and get his body and then perhaps do what he had done to so many other people. According to the New York Times on the evening of August 18, 1895, two men ran into the back of the murder castle and 30 minutes they ran 30 minutes later they ran away. Several explosions erupted and flames raged through the building. The remains were eventually torn down in 1938, and then it had another nightmare built in its place. Still to this very day, it's the Englewood Post Office. That is the story of H.H. H. Holmes's murder castle. Big thank you to the Chicago Tribune, Chicagoist, Crime Viral, How Stuff Works, Adam Seltzer, Mental Floss, Wikipedia, and History.com for information contributing to this story. So, Danielle, what do you think? Do you think this is actually real? Do you think the journalist just ran with this story and created the fiction of all these rooms? I think it's real. I personally do. I've covered him before on my channel. Mm -hmm. It was, oh my gosh, it was so long ago that I'd actually forgotten like half that information. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I think it's real. It does seem super elaborate and kind of high tech in a way for the time period. Mm -hmm. <sighs> but I'm telling you, I've also covered Belle Gunness and that's a female serial killer. I don't know if anyone's aware of her and some of the things she did are absolutely outrageous. But I mean, that one's... That one's been proven true. Yeah. So, I mean, crazier things happen, which sounds insane, but he's, he's, wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I really didn't, I, I didn't want to lean too heavy into the details of some of the murders that he did because they're, yeah. they're brutal. And they are. Uh, quite frequently, they're focusing on women uh, that, that he's taking advantage of as well. But if you do look into the history of him and there's, Obviously, there's numerous books about him. There's yeah. doc documentaries that you can watch. There is a clear escalation of behavior, which we sometimes see with serial killers. And you know that, you know, he essentially takes on this name so that he can kind of schmooze with people in Chicago. And we do know that he at least raised enough money for this building because the building was actually built. Mm -hmm. So it does make you wonder at what point 
if this is a story that's that's kind of growing wild, where does the truth end and where does the fiction actually start? Um, I, I don't think I doubt that there was very very insane criminal mm-hmm. acts that took place at that location. I just don't know that the detail we're getting about the specific rooms is accurate. It could be that it kind of spun out from the reality of one of those crimes. Um, I don't know. Because I've heard that a lot of the reason why he would hire and then fire, you know, different contracting companies Mm -hmm. was so that none of them would be fully aware of the layout of the building. So that way, you know, not many people could say things, you know, he would have them do one part of it. Mm-hmm. And then he'd tell them to go. And then, you know, it was one thing after another. I yeah. find it interesting, though, it started out as kind of scamming people. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's that escalation that you were talking about. But that's that's horrifying. I mean, he would lure people in there. I, I personally know some of the stories. And, I mean, mm-hmm. he would trick the crap out of people. Yeah. Promise yeah. Sometimes all these employees. things. Yeah, and sometimes exactly, even employees. employees. And obviously what he did to Benjamin, but there was other employees also mm-hmm. under the guise of, you know, come work for me. And all of a sudden they turn into a, a victim. Yep. Um, I know I mentioned a medieval torture rack. Um, I got a better description of that a bit later. The medieval torture rack was said to have been an invention of Holmes's called the Elasticity Determinator. That's a terrifying name, isn't it? <laughs> that's that's petrifying. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna put you on the Elasticity Determinator. Uh, he thought that he would be able to create a race of giants by stretching people to twice their normal height. Oh boy. I, I know. It, it, honestly, that's one of those things. I don't know if that's true either. I don't know if that's information that's just kind of coming out because he went to medical school. I was about to say for someone so smart, I just I don't I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Um, also, I found information saying that there was a firm that he hired f- to do the um, the plans of the building. Uh, you know, I don't think that he was actually drawing up the blueprints necessarily mm-hmm. himself, at least for the first two stories. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, he ripped off that place. He didn't pay them either. Um, and if, if I remember correctly, they actually at least tried to sue him. Uh, there's another twist to all this that just happened in 2017. They actually exhumed his body because yep. there was a rumor that he had survived and gotten away and maybe swapped in another body for him. Uh, when they did... The clothes, they said, were nearly perfect because of being encased in concrete. Mm -hmm. And even his mustache was still intact. They did use his teeth to confirm his identity. Um, This all happened around the History Channel uh, series American Ripper, which kind of touched on, um, you know, the fact is he is he related or is he actually Jack the Ripper as well? Yeah, um, which I personally don't believe. Yeah, I don't know if I do either. But yeah. how scary is that, though, that authorities in 2017 were so terrified of the idea that he could have gotten away that they yeah. zoomed him out of concrete? Uh, yeah, yeah. Pretty, pretty insane. And then when they did, they also talked about the fact it's strange because the clothing was preserved, but yeah. the remains D- didn't hold up at all like Mm-mm. they weren't even able to do a dna analysis so that's why they kind of leaned on uh, dental records for the confirmation there so yeah man you beat me again on that one i know it <laughs> oh i don't know don't don't, don't that's count terrifying. yourself out my cabin in the woods is like totally a me personal fear <laughs> yeah it is terrifying and it, um <sighs> It's probably a little early to tell you guys about this, but um, I worked with someone that is writing a book on the Elisa Lamb case and the Cecil Hotel. Seriously, uh, you really want to look into the backstory there. And this book is it's a really, really well done book. Um, It's not out yet. I don't think it's going to come out until about February. Uh, So I'll tell you guys more about it as, as we get closer. But yeah, the Cecil Hotel, I almost thought originally I should just do it about the Cecil because that place is Mm -hmm. truly terrifying. Absolutely horrifying. Yeah. A lot of people consider it like if there is a a place in this world that has negative energy and it's making people do bad things, people think it's the Cecil Hotel. Mm -hmm. Uh, But what I appreciated about the H.H. Holmes story is it's a nightmare that kind of he's creating that yeah. is almost an outlet of his personality that is now being built into a, a physical manifestation. It's yep. really, uh, really dark. Um, but I hope I didn't go too dark for you guys. I tried to keep it in crime after crime friendly territory. Well, see me too, but that's why I think you beat me. 
Oh, well, we'll see. We'll see. AJ it's, Holmes is hard to beat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's up there. He's up there. Some people think he is Jack the Ripper, but even if he isn't, he's definitely up there in yeah. consideration of um, enduring stories. I don't think that mm-hmm. story is going anywhere. No. So we did bump into some other stories in our research. Of course, we like to share those with you guys also. We're going to start with Danielle. What do you got? All right. Well, I don't have too many details. I was worried we wouldn't have time for extra stories because Mm -hmm. I had such a long one. But I stumbled across two of them that were absolutely insane to me. The first one was about a woman, and I can't remember the exact location or her name, but someone reported a lot of thefts in a graveyard. Like the different ornaments and flowers that are put out there, the little, um, what are they called? Help me, John. I'm losing, I'm losing the word. Statues. The- there we go. Perfect. Statues, oh, okay. gravestones. They would go missing. Well, they ended up connecting it back to this woman. She would go to the graveyard, steal all sorts of things, and then decorated her yard with these items. Are you she, kidding me? I'm being so serious. She had her whole driveway lined with gravestones and she had all these creepy signs too that was like stay out of my yard like beware it was terrifying who would want i mean i (sighs) who would want their front yard to look like a cemetery (laughs) but second you're stealing ident i mean a lot of these items have identifying marks on them sometimes people's names dates um how did she expect to get away with that wow we got to save her for like world's dumbest criminal episode or something that's oh, that's crazy she was a nut and apparently she got like really mad when they came to confront her about it but uh, of course the next guy was just like a full-on ding dong because he got incredibly <laughs> intoxicated and he went to a cemetery and while at the cemetery he pretended to be a ghost <laughs> like was saying boo to people and like making funny noises, like dancing all around the cemetery. I think he pretended to play football for a little bit and then went back to scaring people as a ghost. And he, he did end up being arrested for harassment in a cemetery. So, And his name was John Lorden. No. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> was this on Halloween at least? <laughs> Um, I don't, I don't remember. I know he was out drinking. I feel like it might've been. <laughs> wow. But. Wow. <sighs> Well, people are wild. Yes, people are wild. And that's not going to stop as we go into, I've got one story I have to share with you guys because it really fits today's theme. And originally I wanted it to be my story, but there's just, there's not enough detail. It doesn't really go anywhere. But this is uh, from the Tennessean. James J. Yoakum, 29, and three friends headed to Nashville Nightmare in Madison a horror thrill campus with four separate haunted houses, an escape room, carnival games, food vendors, and more. And this is happening just last year. Oh, wow. Yoakum's group started laughing and joking with someone they thought was a cast member. At one point, the cast member handed Yoakum's friend, a female, a knife and told her to stab him with it as retribution for a teasing joke that was made. Uh, So now this is a quote from James. Keep in mind, we'd been chased by chainsaws, holding other weapons, all kinds of stuff all night. And it was all fake, he said. So she stabs me with it and everything got really black. When Yoakum looked down, he saw blood pouring from a knife wound that went clear through his forearm. The thing I remember, he said, is the guy who gave it to her kind of freaking out and saying things like, oh, I didn't know my knife was that that sharp. I didn't know. I'm so sorry. James was taken by ambulance to the ER at TriStar Skyline in Madison. The wound required nine stitches. That is a nightmare. It was an employee. It was, at least from what I can gather, it was an employee there was no charges really filed it seems like the employee didn't realize that it was a real knife somehow this place actually had like metal detectors when you were going there yeah um so there was no weapons that were being allowed from anyone that was visiting there but somehow this employee gets this real knife i heard a little bit more about the conversation like the, the the guy was teasing the girl uh james was teasing the girl or something and then this cast member hands her the knife oh stab him with this and it goes through his arm. Uh, so unfortunately, yeah, I couldn't find anything that happened as fallout of it. There was no charges from what I could find. I couldn't even find the name of the guy, the uh, the cast member supposedly that that handed the knife. It went really, really hush hush. It's one of those stories that kind of yeah. hit national media exposure just for this version of telling it, and then 
completely disappears. I even considered reaching out to James Yoakum myself to see if I can get more, but even I knew it wouldn't be enough. I would just get details of like, oh yeah, we didn't charge him with anything, and they paid oh, that's my terrifying. Yeah, they paid my hospital bill or something along those lines, and and that would have been it. But can you See, imagine? See, my mind was going down the route, probably because of what we're talking about, of like some creepy person, you know, sneaking in, pretending to be an employee, and like oh, convincing yeah. other people to stab each other for like fun. That's terrifying. Wow. That's like yeah. where my mind was going. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, and to goodness. your point, how do you not know? Like, you know, you're a cast yeah. member, you're hired to scare people, someone gives you a knife, you're walking around with a knife. I mean, don't you at least touch it? I mean, you would obviously know it's not plastic. There's not- That is so strange to me, though, because I go to haunted houses all the time. And yeah. I mean, they use like real chainsaws, but there's no blade or anything in them. They're not... It's right. not in a way where it could actually harm someone because accidents happen. Think of the environment. People are running around screaming. Crazy things are happening. I just find it very hard to believe that this real knife just like magically showed up and he didn't know it was a real knife. But Yeah, yeah, it does seem really, really weird. Uh, I do like going to uh, haunted houses as well. As a matter of fact, I heard there's one in Madison, Wisconsin, where you have to sign a waiver and they won't allow children under the age of 13. <laughs> So um, I'll be coming to hang out with you and we can go do that because <laughs> it sounds terrifying and fun all at the same time. <laughs> yeah. I also heard of another one in, I think it's in the San Diego area in California where um, you have to sign a waiver and it can last for like six to eight hours and they'll like shave your head and torture you. And it's, yeah. I think I know what you're talking about. I'm yeah. pretty sure I know what you're talking about because they had like all these videos and stuff, like little five minute videos on places like this where yeah. you do, you have to sign a waiver because like real things happen to you. And they've got a waiting list of like 20,000 people or something. Who the heck? To go that's that. a, I know. That one seems a little bit intense. I don't want my head shaved. Okay? I know. It's taken I know. me six years to grow my hair back out from almost being shaved. I don't need that <laughs> in my life. I don't. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Well, guys, who do you think is going to win this month? I already know it's going to be John. H.H. Holmes takes the cake, at least for me. But he's he's also someone that I've always looked into and been fascinated by. But you guys get to vote as well. All you have to do, again, click the I, go to the Twitter page. Who brought the best haunted house story? That's right. And Danielle, I know you'll at least get a vote from me because I vote for you at both locations. <laughs> is this uh, you admitting that you know your story is better? <laughs> <laughs> if there's only one vote, Danielle, just know that it's coming from me. Okay, the season perfect. of revenge is brutal. I'm um, surprised you're even giving me a vote, honestly. I thought you were going to start voting for yourself this season and be like, forget it. <laughs> no, Done. no. I still give you my vote every time I have to go check those numbers. Uh, all right. And we'll be back November 1st with our next episode. And I'm really excited about this one because it can go so many different directions. The topic yep. is Craigslist criminals. I am so here for this topic. Seriously. Craigslist is one of my favorite places to hang out and just see all the weird things that happen. So <laughs> I'm telling, I mean, who here can't even name like one thing off the top of their head, one crime that's happened on Craigslist. Crazy yeah. things happen. It's yeah. terrifying. So I'm here for it. But until then, you guys can find John and I both on our YouTube channels or across social media. Just look up Daniel Hallen on YouTube for me or Daniel Hallen on social media. Or you could look up Lord and Arts on YouTube or at Lord and Arts on Twitter. You will find us. Uh, you, if you have ideas to submit to us, potentially for upcoming episodes, anything like that, you can email us at crimeaftercrime at lordandarts.com or visit us on Twitter at crimeafterpod. Crime After Crime is produced and hosted by Danielle Hallen and John Lorden. And as always, we want to say a huge, huge thank you to our patrons. You guys get a bonus Patreon se special segment monthly. It gets really interesting over there. Trust me. Mm -hmm. Plus, patrons get a special personal shout out in an upcoming Patreon special. And if you enjoyed today's show, please take a little time, rate or review us on whatever platform you found us on. And really the best way that you can help others find us is to tell your friends, tell your family how much you love crime after crime. Also, do not forget we have a merchandise store. You guys can find us at teespring.com forward slash stores forward slash crime after crime. That's right. You can go there and be a winner every month with your own crime after crime mug. Maybe I'll just go buy one that I know I won't feel guilty about using. 
<laughs> because because the other one I have, that's, you know, strictly winning purposes only. Whatever, yep. John. He's I'm holding up you. his mug for those of you that can't see. Mm. He's enjoying it. I love but it. But <laughs> a huge thank you to you guys. And we hope you have a happy and safe Halloween. And we will see you guys next time on Crime After Crime. See you there. Bye.